It's 4 a.m. and my cell phone rings. I see the number and I know immediately who is on the other end. She will have a strong Filipino accent. She will be a nurse and she is frantic. Mr. Jonathan, can you come here now, please? Your father is, he needs you. The skilled nursing facility is only half a mile away. I park in the spot that says, doctors only. In the two weeks my father has been here, one of the nicer facilities, the, the administration lady keeps telling me, causing me to weep. I have yet to see or meet a single doctor, so there is a reflexive fuck you to the sign and a roll of the eyes. I hate this place, yet I am remarkably calm. That is until I see the staff standing around his room. My father is yelling at someone on the phone. No, he is yelling to someone on the phone, specifically 911. He is unhinged and he's panicking and he desperately wants the police to come. The two men put powder down my pants, he tells the operator. He has barricaded his room and one of the orderlies tries to enter, making a way for me. He kicks the chair. Get away, he shouts to the orderly. What you're doing is illegal. The staff was just trying to clean him. My father is not a shouter. He is gentle and sweet. This isn't the man I know. But the fact that he is raising hell, protecting himself, not giving a fuck, I can't help but be a little proud. The badass gene is definitely recessive in my family. So I'm inappropriately delighted in this moment. Then I hear a scream. There is fear in his voice, what voice there is anyway. His breath trembles and his eyes are a fog of desperation. Dad, I say, it's me. Like a final girl in a slasher flick, trying to let her best friend in the door before it's too late, he pulls back the chairs and the desk he has used to barricade himself into the room, and then he shouts, or he thinks he's shouting, get in here. But truthfully, it's no more than a whisper. In this moment, his body stands and moves with purpose, though it's normally frail. He goes back to the phone. My son is here, he tells the 911 operator. He will protect me. Badasser, badassery can be tolling to those unaccustomed. This, mixed with a healthy intake of carpidopa levodopa, the standard medicine for Parkinson's, can cause spontaneous napping, forcing my father back into his bed. He asks me not to leave. They have a strict policy about family members spending the night, so I simply don't respond. The last time this happened, which was the night before, I told him I wasn't allowed to stay with him the night. And this seemed to cause a sudden rush of anxiety, and obviously I wanted to avoid this. When I get in my car, I see the doctor's only sign again, and I give out another fuck you. But it's not to the absent doctors this time. It's to that place. It's that disease. It's a God that would allow that disease. Growing up, my father came home every day for lunch, or we went to meet him at his office. We traveled the country as my parents were the national champions for tennis in the amateur league two years in a row. My understanding is that he could have gone professional, but instead he chose to marry my mother, an even superior athlete to him, and have a family. He was born into privilege and wealth. My parents were high school sweethearts, and when, when my mother first saw his house, she just assumed he was the child of the servants, as he detested snobbery, dressed plainly, and had no airs. His only interests were tennis, the beach boys, race cars, and my mom. His own father died when he was seven, and he was raised by, by, in part by his socialite Swedish-born mother, but also, and mostly, by a nanny. From an early age, I was writing and performing and dancing and all those things squishy boys like me do. And for my father, who was a jock and worked with numbers, he thought this was the most amazing thing he'd ever seen. In the seventh grade, I told him in passing that I had joined the writing club. Not a big deal, but he sent me the unabridged Oxford Dictionary. And he inscribed to Jonathan, for your writing adventures and beyond, love dad. At seven, the hardest day of my life was not the day he moved out, but the first day he picked me up for his attorney mandated first visitation. Because picking me up and dropping me off officially meant he no longer lived in our house. He was allotted enough time the first visit so we could have dinner and drive around for a bit. No longer was he the man who would wrestle me before I went to bed assuming he didn't let me stay up past my bedtime to watch Hawaii Five-0, and then improvise a bedtime story for me, complete with goofy voices, and never ever did he make me say my prayers. That was my mother's job, something he silently, silently disapproved of. Now he was the man who had to drop me off in time for me to do my homework. As he drove down the street, I did not stop waving. 
I wanted him to know that I was with him. I needed him to know this because as broken as my heart was, it can never match the catastrophic disaster that was his own. He tried to be brave and stoic over the milkshakes and cheese toasties at Steak and Shake that first visit. But his pain was transparent, and I needed him to know that despite everything, he had not lost me. My parents separated in September of my second grade year. Come February of my second grade year, my mother had remarried to my father's best friend. So within six months, the man who my father felt betrayed him the most, his surrogate brother, now occupied his bed, his house, his marriage, his position as our domestic father figure. Then a month after the separation, my dad lost his job. Even though I was just seven, I knew we were treading in dangerous waters. I called him every night. I let him sing to me on the phone, which for me is the definition of un unbridled torture. <laughs> because unless they are in a choir or on a stage, if I hear someone singing, I turn from a gently neurotic, slightly anxious pacifist into a raging homicidal maniac. <laughs> he sings along to every commercial, every song in a movie, and the radio, whether he knows the words or not. <laughs> It drives me crazy. But his guitar was an instrument of healing for me. So I happily indulged, just as he supported my fanaticism in the Church of Light and Sounds, my place of unending miracles, the cinema. He took me to every movie I wanted to see that wasn't rated R. So I let him belt out the goddamn California Dreamin' every fucking night. I let him sing to me the entire catalog of the Beach Boys, except Sadly Pet Sounds, which he calls that weird album. <laughs> the bleakness of this period, the weight of my father's fragility and the crushing heartbreak of losing my family, then regaining a, a bizarro ersatz version without having a moment to catch my breath or even blink, took its toll on both of us. I became reclusive, quiet, broken. He needed to leave. Decatur, Illinois wasn't big enough for both of my parents, so my father decided to move to California. To his credit, he drove cross-country every other weekend for his visitations. And he kept an apartment to cater for years. He needed to let me know he was there for me. And Midwestern, and Midwestern industrial town is not the best place for queer boys like me. But being with my dad in California, it would have a restorative effect. It also became my respite. I could bask in my father's kindness, his non-judgment, his lack of strict religiosity. He would pick the weight of the world off my shoulders and he spun it on the, his finger like a basketball. He asked me to move to California several times and I chose inexplicably to stay in central Illinois because, you know, that's where the movie making dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I don't think he would actually have made a fitting parent like my mother. He was fun in my youth, but he was actually like a giant kid. He held a master's in engineering, an MBA, two, uh, two law degrees. He quit it all. To become a race car driver. <laughs> Thank God he went back to being a lawyer. <laughs> because he wanted more common ground with me, he decided to take acting classes and landed a part in a Burt Reynolds movie where he played a senator who gets assassinated in the first 10 minutes. <laughs> And thank God, because 10 minutes is all any discerning viewer can muster watching a straight-to-video abortion that is Raven. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, during one visit 20 years ago, he simply said, I don't think you should go back. The tone was different. He wasn't humoring me. I stayed in California. Things were great. I found myself. My dad was the first person I came out to, and for a reason. He said, that's okay, little buddy, when I told him, I still love you. He then smiled and gently punched me in my arm. He gave me money for, my, for the deposit for my first apartment in LA. But about 10 years ago, things changed. It started small. Driving, he refused to listen to directions, or he would listen, but he didn't follow through. Simple tasks became harder. Eventually, his motor skills became so impaired, the simple task of eating became an ordeal, often taking an hour to finish a meal. This would lead to a lack of energy and dehydration. It was like his brain and his body and soul were trying to run underwater. Things would only get worse. I moved back from LA. I needed him to know that I was there. With Parkinson's, there are good days and bad days. The good days, he speaks coherently. There is color in his face and he walks without issue. The bad days he is pale, he talks in a whisper, confused. Most days he sleeps. Sometimes at night, 
I would wait to use the restroom, turn on the hall light, and he would just be standing there, like a drooping statue in the dark. Dad, what the hell? And then he would jerk and come out of his trance. I must have been sleepwalking, he would say. A symptom of Parkinson's is lucid dreaming, sometimes involving the entire body. At least once a night he would howl, screaming into the night a painful, ugly, sad, sad sound, his whole body flopping in the bed, and then silence, back to bed. He would start many projects, then be too fatigued or confused to finish, often leaving the house in disarray. Despite having four postgraduate degrees, he often finds it hard to remember simple words. For the most part, however, things were manageable. Between his tennis, obsessively watching every episode of Murder, She Wrote in rotation, and sleep, his days were filled. Then in August, he seemed slightly more confused, slightly less in control of his body. One day I had to hold him up and physically feed him because the sense of balance was so off he couldn't sit on his own. I thought it was just a bad day. I went to work and I came home, finding him lying on the tiled kitchen floor in a pool of blood. At first the hospital staff thought I was neglecting him. Eventually I tried to explain to them that he was literally playing tennis a few days ago. He was still driving. Something happened, this was all of a sudden. Their skepticism soon turned to warmth as I actually had to hold me up. I broke down right there in the ER. Eventually the doctors changed his medicine and we went home. But the new medicine made him nauseous and he was unable to eat. I called his neurologist, a woman, who I began to have doubts over earlier when she, sa when she told my father that a good source of caffeine, a drug that helps fight Parkinson's for information, is Diet Coke. I said, what about, you know, tea? It's also anti-inflammatory. Her response, sure, I prefer Diet Coke. <laughs> She also encouraged a diet of milkshakes and chips ahoy. <laughs> Yay, scripts! <laughs> I try to call Dr. Diet Coke every day for five days before I get a response. A nurse, a nurse calls me back and tells me his body is acclimating to the new medicine and to just stay the course. That night I'm sitting with my father watching television, television and he asks me why there is an animal inside the sofa. Excuse me? It's growling at me. He becomes irritated at my, at my inability to hear said animal. All right, It's time to go to bed, Dad, I say. I chalk it off to lucid dreaming. The next morning he says there's a bat or a bird loose in the room. I stand there for five minutes and there's no sound. He says, oh, okay, must have been a dream. I'm concerned but not alarmed. And I call the neurologist again and again, no response. That night I'm filming a play when my neighbor calls me. The police are here. Your father ran to the street yelling bloody murder. He's hallucinating, bad. I rush home. In a few hours I was away, he thinks he sees his dead father in the laundry room, that someone was trying to steal his car and that little black dots were flying out of the TV, trying to attack him. The emergency, the emergency room doctor's jaw drops when I tell him the dosage Dr. Diet Coke prescribed with the new medicine and the doubling of one he was already on. He said both of those drugs can cause hallucinations and starting off one with such a high dosage and doubling the other on the same day is a shock to the body. It was such a shock to the body that he had a heart attack. After several days in the hospital, he ends up in skilled nursing, where he has to relearn how to walk, talk, eat, and put on shoes. It takes days for the, for the hallucinations to stop, but those give way to delirium at night, which is different than the hallucination. He calls the facility prison, and he's scared. He's vulnerable. So am I. The deterioration of the frontal lobe means the emotions are front and center. He cries easily, and he's unable to mask his fear. Any news story about race particularly sets him off. Never racist, but certainly never the most woke of men. He has become especially sensitive to any news story about police shootings, beatings, protests, you name it, since my sister adopted two boys from East Africa. He lives in fear of their safety. Nice shows like The Voice and America's Got Talent are all he can handle, but even hearing the contestants' backstories with their struggles and obstacles makes him cry like a two-year-old. 
It is both sweet to see his exposed heart, and it's sad to see exposed heart. But for me, all I can think about is that I have seen pain in his eyes like this before. I take him on field trips to see movies, and a new neurologist who regulates his meds. We are now only down to eight pills a day. Because of rehab, he is stronger and more alert than he had previously been. The hallucinations stop, and there are days where we have full conversations at full volume. And there are days where he forgets everything. There are days that are unequivocal hell. When the doctor asks him about his living will, he simply states, Don't ever pull the plug. I want to live. Life is wonderful. He does all the work necessary to recover, to be better than he was before. He is gentle, not really a fighter, but he does the work. I need it because I would have given up long ago. In fact, I had. My sister, says, my sister suggests he move back to Illinois where he can be in a home. No, he says. California is my home. It's his first night home. He is tired, so we miss the Beach Boys concert. And I begrudgingly suggest he play a song or two. No, it's not begrudgingly. His singing is now a magical sound. The guitar remains a medicine. I find myself singing along. God only knows what I do without you. Thank you.